Did you know female authors have won the Governor General's Award for, for English Language 31 out of 84 times? And the Stephen Leacock Award for Humor was won by women nine times out of 75? Yikes, yikes, yikes. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher, and welcome to a very special episode of All About Canadian Books, because we're going to talk about this. And my guest today is award-winning Toronto author and co-founder of the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction, Susan Swan. And Susan is on a mission to change these stats and uplift women and non-binary writers' voices. Yay! <laughs> Welcome to All About Canadian Books, Susan. Thank you, Crystal. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Susan, let's let's talk about these stats. Women are funny. They're brilliant writers. What the heck is going on? I think in regard to the Stephen Leacock Award, there is um, you know, a school of thought that thinks women aren't funny. Men are supposed to be funny. And it is surprising because a lot of our wonderful women writers are, are quite funny. Margaret Atwood is very funny, for instance. And as far as I know, she hasn't had a book nominated for the Stephen Leacock. So I think there's some prejudice there against, or an unconscious bias there perhaps, um, with the idea that women, you know, yes, they can, be profound in their prose, but but maybe they aren't real candidates for humor. And um, yeah, I've, I found that a staggering statistic. The other statistic that is shocking <clears throat> is the Nobel Prize for Literature, and only 17 women have won it since it was started in 1901. And there was a period of time in the 60s of 35 years when no woman author won it, and nobody noticed. Yeah. Now things are a little better. I mean, the the recent award, literary awards, have in Canada, and the United States, some of them have had women authors for the last couple of years. Strides have been made, but our prize is really there to ensure that the strides continue to be made, because um, we can't really depend on a a flavor of the month win or two in 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 um, literary fiction prizes, it's been all too evident throughout our history that there are periods where women make progress and then there is a backlash. So what made you decide to start brand new and, and start a new literary prize for women? Well, I was crazy, I guess. <laughs> you know, I, I, I uh, didn't really, it wasn't my original idea. This is how it came about, Crystal. I was asked by Hal Wake to come up with a, you know, a report on the progress of women's writing over 50, the last 40 years for the Vancouver Writers' Fest. And I was on a panel with Kate Moss, who had started the Women's Prize for Fiction in the UK, and several other women who'd been involved in, in women's publishing, including, of course, Carol's daughter, Anne Giardini, who was our moderator. But before I went on the panel, Jane Urquhart said to me, I think you'd better investigate the number of times women win literary prizes. She said, it's not what you think. And I thought, oh, well, okay, just to humor her. And I did, and I was absolutely shocked because there, this was in 2012. And as I say, things are a bit better now, but back then women authors earned 45% less than men earned, um, received one third of the literary prizes and one third of the book coverage in both Canada and the United States. So I, I told Hal before the event, I said, look, this, I think this is probably a news story. And he said, oh no, we just want, you know, just sort of a rosy kind of picture of how <laughs> things have improved. And I said, yeah, they've improved somewhat. We have some very famous women authors here, like Margaret Atwood and Alice Monroe, but it's not what you think. And he, he was, um, you know, he was very gracious, but I could tell he didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. However, that night when I got up and talked and the audience was mostly women, 
everyone was absolutely horrified as I knew that they would be, because I had gone through the same thing, thinking women's writing was fine, had stars, there was no problem. And after the event, the editor, Janice Sewardney, came up to me and said, I'd like to start a Women's Prize for Fiction. And I said, if you do, I'll help you. And those were, you know, fateful words for both of us. <laughs> and it's interesting because, um, Janice doesn't remember that she was the one that came up with this idea, but she was, it was her reaction to my speech. And then my promise to her, well, okay, yeah, we should do something about it. So that's how it began. And Don Oravac, who was then um, chair of the Writers' Trust in Canada, he approached us, or Janice rather, about a week later and said, look, I I'd like to help. So that's, that's, the, that's the start of it. And it was, um, we, none of us had any idea how hard it was going to be. Yeah, so Susan, so Susan, when you first brought this idea forth, how was it, how was it received? Were people like, yes, we've got to do this? Was the industry ready to embrace another award? What, did you get any kickback for that? Well, we had a lot of meetings with people in the early days, publishing people like Alan Salzman and Jim Polk, who used to be an editor at House of Anansi and work in the Ontario government uh, and culture, um, and many, many others. And there was a lot of naysaying actually, because Canadians are very good at being skeptical, right? So uh, that was sort of startling. It wasn't an immediate embrace, oh, this is wonderful. It was like, well, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Janice and I, after one of these meetings, we, we would just shake our heads um, because we were we were sort of galvanized, I guess you would say. And the uh, sort of naysaying is uh, something I learned about Canadian skepticism is that if you listen to the skeptical comments first and acknowledge them, then people Canadians primarily will be more receptive to your idea, but they have to find the fault in a piece of goods first before they buy, right? So what's wrong with this idea? It's not what's right with this idea. It's what's wrong with this idea. <laughs> My mother was like that. Uh, um, she was always looking for the thing that was wrong before she could feel comfortable embracing mm -hmm. something. And, and we went through this numerous times. And that was the kind of naysaying part and then, of course, there were much more um, irate reactions. I was really taken aback by the reactions of two prominent West Coast male authors who said that if we were going to give a prize to women for literature, then we had to give it to every ethnicity. And I said, ethnicity? Women aren't an ethnicity. What are you talking about? Oh, yes, they are, I was told. And um, I, I believe they meant mar every marginalized group, but somehow they had conceived it in their minds that we women were exactly similar to an ethnicity. So I couldn't talk them out of that idea. After that, they uh, lapsed into sort of remarks about the stats that I'd made them up or I cherry picked them. <clears throat> And I explained that actually the statistics at that time were came from two organizations, the SWILA, which is the Canadian Women for the Literary Arts, which was based in Vancouver. And it traced you know, the, re, the book coverage and the number of women um, who won awards. And it's now defunct, unfortunately, because we have to do that research. But again, this is true in both countries and VIDA in the American, publishing world has a website where they they chart women, the progress of women's writing. So it wasn't very hard to find the stats. And the stats that the two men were so dubious about had come from real surveys of both organizations. And uh, so I was quite confident that I was right and they were crazy um, or misguided. Maybe that's a nicer way to put it. Anyway, you know, you see the, um, the beginning, what, was not a promising beginning, although the media was interested in the idea. Marsha Lederman wrote a great piece about it. 
And so there was some positive media reaction, but generally there was an idea that, you know, this was either not needed um, or why aren't, you know, as Margaret Atwood said in her speech in Nashville when the prize was being awarded last week, um, why, aren't, why isn't there just a prize for people? Or, oh, I know, and another reaction was, um, why aren't there prizes for men? And I used to say, there are prizes for men. Most of the men w win them. Oh, that was news. Um, anyway, it's, it's very uh, amusing to look back because those kinds of discussions seem so very quaint and even sedate in our you know, highly polarized uh, political climate. Oh my gosh, like I, it, it's, it's shocking. And I'm so glad that you persevered because, and boy, did you ever, because what a prize, $150,000 US was awarded to the winner, a residency at the Fogo Island Inn, and the short list, was it 12,500 each of those? Of That's those, right. Which is, it which is just Fabulous. There are um, also our 11 mentoring programs, which give grants and residencies to emerging women writers in Canada and the United States, with a special oh. focus on those from marginalized communities. And it, uh, it's really more than a prize, uh, because it's a network of established women authors and publishing um, executives or editors um, it, it's a mix of Americans and Canadians mm -hmm. in the business. But there was also pushback to the amount, actually, as Margaret Atwood admitted from her. She thought it was too much. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, if it's a small amount, the prize won't be taken seriously, in keeping with this idea of women as an ethnicity. Um, that, you know, it'll be seen as a niche prize and not very important. And we want to sell books and we want to demonstrate the seriousness of our commitment to improving the economic conditions of the lives of women writers. So we need a big amount. And then I would always say, because women writers are worth it, which of course they are. <laughs> they certainly are. And winning a prize like this will, will change the writer's life. It will dramatically improve their um, it will boost their career dramatically. Um, yeah. and, and also when you win a literary prize, it tends to boost book sales. Mm -hmm. Essia Dugin, when she won the uh, Giller Award in Canada, her sales increased by 479%. Yeah. And um, um, <clears throat> it's, so it has this sort of magic to it uh, that can, really create an interest in the book and bring the writer more money from book sales. And again, of course, more, you know, a better advance next time around the next book. And Susan, how many entries were there? Well, 250 books were mm -hmm. entered. It is a, you know, binational prize. We wanted to do it fairly early on in the spring of June 2014, we invited some American uh, literati in to help us. Roxanne Robinson, the president of the Authors Guild in the US, and Noreen Tomasi, who at the time ran the Brooklyn's Center for Fiction, joined us. And the idea was to that we would be stronger together. We had the same problem, and we would be stronger together. And the jury of women, it was a jury of five women who read all of these wonderful entries. And because it's an inaugural event, uh, there's going to be a lot of eyes on this jury and what they're choosing for the short, the long list and the short list. Absolutely. It, it's a lot of pressure. Um, what advice was the jury given about, about selection and just their role in the whole con uh, prize contest? Well, we don't give instructions to the jury, but mm -hmm. we do make them aware that our values are first literary excellence. And we also value diversity 
and we are a prize in two countries. There's been a reaction in Canada that there aren't enough Canadian, there weren't enough Canadian women writers on the prize. Mm -hmm. But actually what a lot of the critics don't understand is that jury members, they don't select a book based on nationality. They pick the book that really speaks to them. And we had on the jury three Canadian writers and two American. So if anything, the, the jury was stacked to slightly favor uh, Canadian writers. But these are the books they chose. And I, I've got sort of an idea why. Um, I was really surprised and delighted when I read the books and found that most of them echoed a kind of they echoed the work of Carol Shield somehow. She had a real talent for um, narrative luminosity, if you like, and an elegance of language and wit and humor and tender insights into the human condition. And uh, I asked, I pinpointed one of the jurors and said, you know, were you channeling Carol when you picked these books? And uh, she admitted, yeah, she thought of Carol every time she chose a book. So. The Carol's um, oeuvre, if you like, was a, uh, a presence in, in the jury selection. And I was delighted by that. I'm sorry Carol couldn't see the and read the books, meet the, you know, meet the finalists and read the books herself because she, I know she would have approved. Oh, and wow, it's a perfect segue to talking more about Carol Shields. Like I understand that you knew Carol personally. Susan, can you tell us about Carol Shields, what she was like? Carol was um, an amazing woman because she'd been brought up in this genteel suburb of Oak Park in Chicago. It's the same suburb that Hemingway was brought up in. And she had a kind of quiet life there. She said that she never met a Black or Jewish person in the suburb. She was very sheltered and she, you know, she was sorry about that, but that was just how it was. Um, and when she went to Hanover College, an arts college, she won the first prize for fiction at the college. And the, um, but she didn't get to keep it. She um, was told that the runner up who was in second place was a male student and he needed the prize money because he was going to go on and raise a family. This is true. And would Carol give the prize to him? And of course, like the well brought up lady she had been, was taught to be, she agreed. So it's very kind of ironic to compare how you know Hemingway was immediately successful. He went, he left to Oak Park and uh, went off into the world and to write about war. And he was immediately successful. Carol's life was a slow build to a real literary success, where she won many, many prizes. And of course, as a an older woman writer, a veteran, she didn't uh, put up with any nonsense. She was very kind. She was very uh, loving, actually, but she had no time um, for her male compadres who would boast. I remember standing in a group with her once and, and uh, she and I were in this sort of very interesting conversation about a book and a male writer came up to her, came up to both of us and just broke in and interrupted as if we were saying nothing of any importance. And, and she turned to him and she said, you know, I no longer have to put up with this kind of arrogance. And then she quickly, quietly walked away. She didn't say it in a harsh tone. She said it in this, you know, kind of soft speaking voice that she had. And he was flabbergasted. So I remember thinking at the time, you know, she, she may be kind um, and supportive, but she is nobody's fool and she doesn't like fools either. So <laughs> she, she made that clear to me that day. And um, the other thing I can say about her is that she mentored a lot of women and she mentored me. Uh, she was very kind to me and uh, 
you know, the prize, she embodies the spirit of the prize, which is women helping women. That's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Very beautiful. It's very touching. And it's, uh, but it's also a very powerful truth that uh, I think women tend to be more collaborative than men and less interested in dominance and competitions. Not that women can't be competitive, because of course we're all human, but um, I think because of our history, we have been taught to collaborate more. So it, there's something natural about the prize in that way. And in Nashville, it was interesting to see the older women writers talking to the younger women writers talking, you know, the, the black and brown writers talking to white writers. We were all, it felt like we were all together, you know, generationally and, and uh, um, racially. And of course, with different gender identities because mm -hmm. our prize winner is a, a non-binary author and the prize is open to non-binary authors. Aww. So there's a, an amazing sort of spirit of uh, appreciation and tolerance that I saw in Nashville. Oh. <laughs> that just warms my heart and it makes me feel very, very hopeful and excited. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. That's absolutely you know, me too. It made, it made us all feel that way. And we were in the States, of course, where they're having all these terrible pushbacks to women's rights with the abortion yeah. bans. And, um, you know, it's it's not a good time for the progress of women in America at the moment. No. No, it's, it's certainly not. Um, you know, just on a personal level, like for someone who spent, like this award was, was it almost 11 years in the making? Yes. Oh my gosh. And for you, Susan, I can't imagine what it was like for you on May 4th, sitting in the audience when all of the work and effort and everything is coming together and then they announced Fatima Ashgar, her debut novel, When We Were Sisters as the prize winning novel. Like what was going through your mind when all this is happening? I began to get nervous about the prize announcement. I wasn't really nervous before that, mm -hmm. but BMO is the sponsor of the, uh, the prize awards and uh, Kimberly Good, the BMO executive, got up on the stage and and suddenly I you know I sat up and I thought oh my goodness here it comes and I really didn't know how the, the jurors would pick a winner because yeah. the books were a very high quality as I was saying earlier because they had this elegance and storytelling craft that you would find in Carol's books anyway um, so when the winner was an announced I was thrilled I was also um I guess, transported in a way that I, I've had success as a writer and I, it feels good, but somehow this is a deeper feeling that was more um, a feeling about continuity of generations and no matter what is happening uh, in the world with women's rights that, you know, the next generations were going to prevail. So it was, it was, a. I felt it made me feel very hopeful. And I, I was live streaming from home and it was really magical to watch too. I was, yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it was an, I thought it was a really exciting evening and I look forward this summer to like going through all of those books and having some really high quality reading. Oh, you'll have a great time with them. Yeah. Yeah, they're, and uh, they're they're very different, but they all share a, a quality of good storytelling. And it's hard; it 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 truly is hard to say that this one is absolutely better than the other one because of the standard that the jury, I guess, followed when they were picking the books. You know, no, I, I'm I'm really delighted and uh, look forward to next year when the prize is in Toronto. Oh yeah, and. Fatima must have been so excited too. Didn't prepare a speech. Yeah. yeah. They didn't obviously expect to win because it, I got the sense that they were talking 
pretty much extra, you know, just off the cuff. And, and this was a total surprise. Wow. Well, Susan, congratulations for all of your effort and all of the efforts from everyone behind the scenes because to put on an award like this, especially inaugural one, there's a lot of collaboration going on behind the scenes and my goodness, congratulations. What a fantastic job and an exciting movement for women and non-binary writers. Thank you, Crystal. And it's true. It, it was an amazing team of women that made this possible. And there are lots of wizards behind the scenes, like our CEO, Alex Scotchless, who organized the event, and Julie Jacobson, um, who lives in Chicago, who was in charge of the event. So all of this came together in a most beautiful way. And I really appreciate you having us on your podcast. It's my absolute pleasure. Viewers, I will put links down below so you can go to the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction website. All of the books are listed there so you can go through them all and read them this summer or over the next year. And thank you, Susan Swan. It is always a pleasure to speak with you. I always learn so much. Oh, that's a very kind thing to say. Thank you. I enjoyed our conversation, Crystal. Thank you. Bye, everyone.